Pretty. All right. Well, morning, everyone. Uh, today's grand rounds. First, I'm Farid Katie. I'm a uh, general surgery, and uh, my, we focus our practice uh, practice on uh, uh, abdominal, abdominal reconstruction, mostly uh, foregut surgery and uh, gastric surgery. Uh, Dr. Richardson has asked me to prepare a talk on the management of uh, peptic ulcer disease uh, based on our experience uh, during the mock oral exams where we see a lot of confusion uh, with the senior residents uh, in the management of, of peptic ulcer disease and, uh, uh, and foregut disease. So, uh, in, uh, you know, without further ado, uh, the, we start with definitions and, you know, the peptic ulcer is an excavated lesion uh, in the gastric or the renal mucosa that extends through the muscularis into the deeper layers of the uh, of the wall, and uh, the incidence of peptic ulcer disease was much higher than one case per one thousand person years. Uh, it, it varies on the presence of H. pylori, uh, which increases the incidence by about tenfold. The incidence increases with age for both the renal and gastric ulcers, both. Uh, for straight, both for uncomplicated and complicated uh, ulcers. And the incidence of complications is 0.7 per, per 1,000 years. In other words, the 70% chance of the complicated ulcer happening. The complicated ulcer is defined as bleeding, penetration, perforation, or gastric out obstruction. So as I mentioned, uh, it was, peptic ulcer disease was uh, the most common indication for gastric surgery before the advent of anti-secretory medications. Uh, the identification of H. pylori and the introduction of um, proton pump inhibitors have contributed to the, to, the decreases, uh, to the decrease of this medical condition. Bleeding is still the most uh, common complication of peptic ulcer uh, requiring hospitalization. So H. pylori, NSAIDs, and including the, the, the use of low dose aspirin are the most common etiologies of ulcer bleeding and ulcer perforation. In observational studies, duodenal ulcers account for 60% of perforations. 20% of perforations are in the uh, pyloric channel or the uh, prepyloric area, and 20% are in the body of the stomach. Most ulcers are asymptomatic, and 40 to 90% of patients with a bleeding ulcer have no previous epigastric discomfort or any suggestive symptoms of peptic ulcer disease. As you can see, there's many other uh, symptoms associated uh, with, peptic, uh, with peptic ulcer disease, um, which are in front of you on the screen, uh, and we, have, we don't have to go through all of them, uh, but, but they're right there. So etiologies and uh, disease associations are numerous with peptic ulcers. First and foremost are infections, and of course, H. pylori takes the cake here, followed by CMV and herpes zoster uh, virus. Drug exposures like NSAIDs and steroids play a significant role in the uh, pathogenesis of peptic ulcer disease. You have hormonal causes, uh, causes like uh, 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 zollinger ellison syndrome, antral G-cell hyperplasia. We also know that uh, <clears throat> uh, decompensated states um, like uh, uh, patients in the ICU, uh, severe neurologic uh, uh, injury, uh, you know, immunocompromised cirrhosis, et cetera, can predispose patients to peptic ulcers, among other uh, conditions. So, helicobacter and NSAIDs alone are not likely to be sufficient for ulcer formation. Other risk factors have to be involved for patients to, to develop ulcers, including smoking, alcohol, probably genetic predisposition, maybe diet and psychological factors. Smoking is an independent risk factor for both symptomatic and asymptomatic peptic ulcer disease. Ulcers are twice as common in smokers versus non-smokers, and they are more difficult to treat and they recur more often. We all have heard of uh, alcoholic gastritis. Alcohol in very high concentrations or amounts breaks down the mucosal barrier and Alcohol in and by itself is an acid stimulant. Genetic and immune factors can contribute to peptic ulcer disease. Uh, 
Again, there are independent um, uh, risk factors, uh, regardless of H. pylori infection. Uh, the culprits are IL-1, 6, 8, and 10, and tumor necrosis alpha. Psychologic factors uh, have been identified in prospective studies, uh, or in prospective studies, poorly tolerated stress or depressive symptoms uh, at baseline increase the risk of ulcer disease over the next 9 to 15 years of an individual's life. But the pathophysiology or uh, pathophysiologic mechanism is uh, unclear. <clears throat> and again, here, stress is associated with peptic ulcer is independent of H. pylori or NSAIDs, specifically the renal ulcers. But it's worth to stress as well that, um, or to no pun intended, uh, it's also worth mentioning that the relationship between psychosocial factors and ulcer disease does not establish causality. This is a, a quick uh, overview of um, of the um, various gastric uh, of, of gastric histology. There are multiple secretory functions uh, uh, of the stomach, starting with parietal cells, which are located uh, mostly in the body and um, cardio of the stomach, and they secrete hydrochloric acid. Chief cells secrete pepsin. Mucous cells are located mostly in the antrum and secrete alkal and an alkaline mucus. The G cells are located also in the antrum and are responsible for the secretion of gastrin. Now, the secretion of gastrin, if you all can recall, uh, is controlled by negative feedback by acid secretion. So when we're doing an entrectomy, it's imperative to resect the stomach or the antrum in its entirety and not leave any cuff of antrum because leaving a cuff of antrum would result in retained G cells, which will go unchecked from an acid bath which in turn lead to increased acid secretion and possibly marginal ulceration. These cells also uh, live in the antrum, uh, which secretes somatostatin, which in and by itself uh, plays a very important uh, inhibitory role on gastrin, gastrin secretion. So ulcer formation, we always, we always think of ulcers as uh, secondary to hypersecretion of acid, but it's, it is more than that. It's, it's, it's a more function of um, secretory defense and repair mechanisms. In addition to its multiple effects uh, uh, on, the, on, on the stomach, H. pylori disrupts the, the mucosal barrier. NSAIDs, um, through the inhibition of cyclooxygenase, inhibit prostaglandin E2 production, which results um, in increased acid secretion, decreased mucosal barrier, decreases the amount of bic uh, bicarbonate, and decreases blood flow <clears throat> to the mucosa which all predispose to peptic ulcer disease. Even though we think of an ulcer as secondary to hypersecretion of acid, 50% of gastric ulcer types have normal acid secretion, specifically types one, four, and five. We'll talk about those in a second. The needle ulcer is always associated with hypersecretion of acid. The, the, the association of H. pylori uh, with, um, uh, with acid secretion is complicated. And uh, so we, you have long-term pan gastritis, where the majority of stomach is infected by H. pylori, is associated with a decreased acid secretion. However, uh, antral gastritis uh, from H. pylori is associated with decreased somatostatin and increased acid production. Um, and, and again, we'll elaborate on those in a second. Other um, uh, factors for acid hypersecretion include the muscarinic-dependent vagal hyperactivity, or uh, primary hypergastrinemia uh, in the absence of uh, uh, gastrinoma or, um, uh, or G-cell hyperplasia. So touching on GERD and uh, uh, peptic ulcer disease, uh, again, because uh, we're visiting this because, uh, because there's, there seems to be a lot of confusion during the mock oral boards uh, between um, GERD, uh, the management of GERD and peptic ulcers. 46% 46 46 of patients with peptic ulcer disease have gastroesophageal reflux disease or some form, some form of it. Uh, again, the relationship between GERD and H. pylori is complex. But to be clear, H. pylori has no effect on esophageal gastric junction competence. There is no effect on transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. And again, H. pylori has no effect on esophageal peristalsis and acid clearance. So 
back to H. pylori, uh, back to gastritis. Uh, there are two types of H. pylori infections: antrum dominant and fundus dominant gastritis. For antrum dominant gastritis, uh, it mostly affects. Uh, it starts with the D cells, uh, which secrete somatostatin, and as I mentioned, is a potent inhibitor of gastric release. H. pylori infection imp impacts somatostatin secreting cells, decreasing uh, uh, somatostatin, and as a result, there's a, the loss of negative feedback on gastrin, resulting in hypersecretion of acid. This lack of feedback inhibition is the most significant factor for the increased acid secretion found in patients with duodenal ulcers and H. pylori and H uh, who are H. pylori positive and have antral dominant gastritis. Moving on to fundus dominant gastritis or pangastritis, it's associated with increased gastrin levels, but this is secondary to reduced acid secretion from parietal cells. And unlike the antral type that affect the D cells, it is proposed that corpus dominant gastritis decreases acid secretion by local inflammation and increased level of cytokines, specifically TNF alpha and interleukin 1. Uh, eventually leading to hypochlorhydra and gastric atrophy. So the reverse of H. pylori-induced corpus-dominant gastritis has the potential to increase gastric acid secretion, which in turn can render some symptomatic GERD in patients who are predisposed to gastroesophageal reflux. So, you know, the... The, the, the prevalence of H. pylori and the impact on health was very significant. In fact, it was so significant that the Nobel Prize for Medicine and uh, Physiology was awarded in 2005 to Drs. Warren and Marshall, who discovered H. pylori in 1982. Again, the, the, so the effects of, of, um, of uh, H. pylori infection would lead to duodenal ulcers, um, lead to malt lymphoma, and this is a very common board question. The answer to uh, the treatment of multiple lymphoma is not chemotherapeutic agents, it's not radiation, it's not surgery, it is in fact triple therapy for H. pylori infections. And um, of course, uh, atrophic gastritis leads to intestinal uh, metaplasia and eventual gastric cancer. So, in summary, H. pylori does not cause GERD, it unmasks it. In patients with duodenal ulcers, Chronic H. pylori infection is the most important risk factor predisposing to uh, duodenal ulcer disease. It is not stress, it is not spicy food. The lifetime prevalence of peptic ulcer disease in H. pylori infected patients is approximately 5 to 10 percent. And because antrum dominant H. pylori gastritis is associated with increased gastric acid secretion, these patients should be at increased risk for developing GERD and duodenal ulcer disease, both of which would resolve should H. pylori get treated. On the flip side, with pangastritis, it's associated with decreased acid secretion, so when you treat H. pylori, they may get predisposed to GERD. So, uh, Dr. Smith from, uh, from our department and Dr. Larson published a study in 2013 in surgery um, uh, discussing the socioeconomic disparities in peptic, ulcer, in peptic ulcer disease. Um, in that study, the total number of operations. So, what they did, what they compared, what they compared the, um, uh, the surgeries or the the, the incidence of uh, surgeries at GLH, which is a safety net hospital, to a private practice hospital, specifically uh, Norton. And uh, during the time period from 2008 to 2011, uh, they the 142 procedures were, were performed uh, at uh, ULH and 24 were performed at Norton which was statistically significant. Uh, Northern Hospital followed the national trends over the same time period with a decrease in operations of, for peptic ulcer disease of approximately 93% between 1967 and 2008. In contrast with the national, with the national average and Northern Hospital experience, the number of operations for peptic ulcer disease at TLH increased from 27 per year in 1985 to 36 per year in 2008. The majority of these procedures were emergent and the, um, uh, they were treated with either a mental patch, wedge resection, gastrectomies, uh, etc. But um, and we will discuss those in a second. But the key the, the key observations of this study is that first, patients 
of lower socioeconomic standing may have increased rates of complicated peptic ulcer disease because of the multiple, multiple medical factors and socioeconomic factors um, uh, associated with this patient population. And number two, it's imperative that we stay on top of our clinical skills and um, uh, the knowledge of how to manage uh, patients with uh, peptic ulcer disease because it is, um, uh, it is still prevalent in our patient population. So the workup of uh, uh, peptic ulcer disease is um, uh, it essentially starts with the with the endoscope. The uh, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy is the is the workhorse for the diagnosis of peptic ulcer disease. Um, you, when you do an EG, when you do an EGD, it's imperative to get biopsies for H. pylori. If you don't get them, you can um, you can get a breath test or an antibody test for H. pylori. Um, uh, patients should should um, uh, get a gastrin level measure, uh, measurement. And you have to make sure that patients are off proton pump inhibitors before you um, measure uh, their uh, their gastrin level because PPIs will suppress acid, and as a result, this ne the, ne the negative feedback goes unchecked, and gastrin level would uh, uh, would increase. Um, and number three uh, or number four is uh, I always find it useful to get a CAT scan uh, before I uh, plan to perform elective surgery. On a, on a refractory peptic ulcer or a gastric outer obstruction, it um, it allows you to um, to have, see the lay of the land, see what if there's a uh, how, how bad the penetration is, uh, uh, you know how associated it is with the pancreas, etc. Uh, so even though it's it's not a clear recommendation, uh, you won't go wrong getting a CAT, getting a CAT scan if you're planning an elective uh, gastrectomy for uh, for peptic ulcer disease. So moving on to the treatment of uh, peptic ulcer disease, we start with the uh, pharmacologic uh, treatment. And uh, it is, it's imperative or important to remember that most large studies of patients who have undergone definite ulcer surgery were performed prior to the recognition of H. pylori. And so uh, the, the, the tenant of treatments of peptic ulcer disease in this day and age is the eradication um, of uh, H. pylori which is achieved with triple therapy. There are multiple regimens, which I'm not, not go, going to get into, uh, but the basic one is BID PPIs, amacrylid, and, uh, and amoxicillin or flagyl for two weeks. At the end of the course, uh, you don't have to continue patients on long-term PPIs unless, or, or, or proton pump inhibitors, unless they have un, an un, a, a complicated ulcer. So, one thing worth mentioning is that um, combining PPIs and H2 blockers adds, adds cost with no enhanced healing of, of the ulcers. And um, you know, antacids like Tums and sucralfate can heal the renal ulcers, but they are not routinely recommended anymore uh, because of the prevalence of uh, PPIs and uh, the much better uh, uh, symptom resolution and, and treatment of PPIs. So again, how long do we treat? In, in patients with uncomplicated ulcers, uh, it, treatment is for 14 days only. Uh, additional an, additional anti-secretive therapy is not needed. It is worth noting that eradication of H. pylori, even with that concurrent acid suppression therapy, heals more than 90% of those patients. Now in patients with complicated peptic ulcers and H. pylori positive patients, and these patients like, like bleeding, perforation, uh, uh, or bleeding penetration and gastric outer obstruction, they should initially receive uh, suppressive therapy with uh, uh, by uh, you know intravenously, and then once they can tolerate PO, it gets switched to BID PPIs for four weeks, and then once daily for um, up to twelve weeks. In um, in patients who are H. pylori negative. The algorithm is a bit different and um, and less uh, less evidence based. So with with H. pylori negative ulcers, there are that are not associated with NSAID use. It is recommended that initial PPI therapy lasts for four weeks for uncomplicated ulcers and eight weeks for a gastric ulcer or un, or any complicated ulcer before repeat endoscopic evaluation. Although the natural history of these ulcers is not clear. It is important to review the patient's history for the adequacy of H. pylori testing and uh, making sure that they are NSAID free. Um, 
in, in the absence of H. pylori and NSAID use, uh, it's not clear whether long-term PPIs or surgical therapy is the best option. Surveillance endoscopy, uh, it's, not, it's not routinely indicated in duodenal ulcers. For uh, gastric ulcers, uh, symptoms, um, uh, you, know, you, you should repeat endoscopy if symptoms persist, or um, uh, if, uh, if the etiology is unclear, if patients have a giant ulcer, if biopsies were not performed in the index operation, and, and you know, and, and the, the indications are, are are on the screen. And uh, then moving on to uh, definition of refractory ulcers, this is uh, worth bringing up because uh, it is one of the few uh, reasons for elective peptic ulcer disease in our current uh, era. A refractory peptic ulcer is defined as an endoscopically proven ulcer greater than five millimeters in diameter that does not heal after eight to 12 weeks of treatment with a proton pump inhibitor. There is significant overlap in the risk factors for refractory and recurrent peptic ulceration. Sorry? Uh, to, uh, to, uh, we have to reevaluate um, uh, the, the risk factors before we, uh, uh, before we proceed with any further management. We have to reevaluate the risk factors. We have to eradicate H. pylori or make sure it's eradicated. Make sure we avoid the culprit medications like NSAIDs and others, and uh, evaluate the uh, the uh, tobacco status uh, of the patients before we proceed with uh, any uh, surgical intervention. Which finally brings us to the surgical management of peptic ulcer disease. Two broad categories: emergent and elective management. For emergent emergent management is reserved for bleeding and perforation. Elective management is um, addressed or is uh, reserved for chronic or refractory peptic ulcers, gastric ulcer obstruction, and suspected malignancies. These, the procedures are divided into local procedures. Uh, so for perforation, uh, the, the, the workhorse for a perforated ulcer is uh, a mental patch, whether it's a straightforward gram patch or a mental patch or a modified patch. The difference between the two is with a uh, with a gram patch, uh, with, uh, you just plug the hole with momentum, and uh, we uh, secure we secure the momentum to the ulcer with the sutures. With a modified gram patch, we approximate the defect after uh, debriding the edges, and then we uh, secure the momentum on top of it. Uh, suture ligation of a duodenal ulcer uh, is another uh, local therapy. Uh, we uh, we will dwell more on it in a little bit. Uh, Pyroplasty and vagotomy, uh, entrectomy and vagotomy, and uh, with a multiple types of reconstruction, and uh, a, a root and Y uh, reconstruction for a subtotal gastrectomy. So, the Johnson, the, the Johnson classification of gastric ulcers uh, defines five types of ulcers. Type one is, uh, is the, ulcer, the ulcer is located on the lesser curvature. This is usually uh, associated with a hyposecretory state. And when we say hyposecretory, we're not saying acolor hydra. It's just like the, the level of acid secretion is less than what's expected from a hypersecreted ulcer like a type two or three. So uh, even though type one ulcers are, have classically been considered uh, the consequence of inadequate gastric mucosal, uh, of, uh, inadequate gastric mucosal defense, um, most surgeons advocate vagotomy with the entrectomy for the, for the treatment of this ulcer. Uh, nobody will fault you for doing a vagotomy for a, a gastric, uh, for, for, for a gastric ulcer. Type 2 gastric ulcers um, occur, uh, are easy to remember. They occur uh, with, in association with a duodenal ulcer. So there's two ulcers, one in the, duodenum, one in the prepyloric area. They are typically associated with a hypersecretory state. Top three ulcers um, are prepyloric, uh, but there's no precise anatomic definition where prepyloric is. Uh, they occur in the setting, again, of increased acid secretion. Uh, but uh, also, uh, uh, many studies have, have, been, uh, have, been, have demonstrated that uh, uh, there's relatively poor results, uh, uh, even uh, sorry, for the recurrence of uh, top three ulcers, even with a vagotomy. And the recurrence rate is anywhere from 16 to 44%. Still, 
and interactive amygotomy is the most prudent approach for these uh, ulcers. Uh, type four ulcers are, uh, uh, are ulcers uh, up uh, towards the uh, GE junction, and typically these are uh, ulcers which, which are uh, very hard to manage. Uh, if you have a perforated ulcer, uh, you're looking at a possible uh, total gastrectomy with esophageal digitostomy and the setting of a contaminated field. Um, uh, if you have a bleeder, uh, again, it's hard to get uh, endoscopically, and uh, so uh, management is hard. And uh, it, it, it just typically, it, typically, it is um, uh, the most challenging ulcer to address. Top five uh, ulcers uh, are associated with NSAID use. Uh, and that no, no surgery is indicated for these ulcers, just a cessation of uh, NSAIDs. So moving on to the uh, surgical management and the procedures, uh, we start with the vagotomy and the polaroplasty, specifically the Haneke Mikulix polaroplasty. And uh, this is indicated for type two and three gastric ulcers in, in addition to the adrenal ulcers. And whenever you do a vagotomy, there's three kinds of vagotomy. You have truncal vagotomy, where you divide the upper trunk of vagus, uh, a selective vagotomy, which is a bit lower, and the high, highly selective vagotomy, which uh, essentially divides the crow's foot um, uh, of, the, of the vagus nerve. And the poroplasty is indicated because there's a 3% uh, uh, chance of uh, gastroparesis in these patients. And the way a, a Heineken Michelitz uh, Poroplasty is performed is by creating a an incision along the longitudinal along the axis of the stomach longitudinally, and then closing it in a transverse fashion, essentially fish mouthing the pylorus, um, and allowing uh, uh, and, and minimizing the resistance of the pyloric uh, sphincter to, to the passage of uh, gastric contents. Other uh, what we call surgical legacy procedures include the uh, Finney and the Jebele. Uh, uh, polaroplasties, and uh, so patients whose, whose ulcer disease is severe enough to create an obstruction rarely have a duodenum that is pliable enough to permit a polaroplasty. So if any um, uh, can be done where, where maybe there's a minimal fibrosis is one, in one area of the duodenum, or a jabulae, um, uh, which is a lateral lateral gastrodenostomy uh, uh, happens, uh, uh, is done uh, to, to basically di uh, uh, divert or uh, as an emptying or as a drainage procedure. Again, uh, these are mostly surgical legacy procedures and um, uh, they're not performed much anymore. Uh, entrectomy and vagotomy is, is the workhorse for gastric ulcer operations. The entrectomy eliminates uh, the G cells in the antrum and uh, gets rid of the ulcer. The vagotomy decreases acid secretion. And uh, the reconstruction is um, either birth one, which is a gastrogenostomy, a birth two, which is the gastrogenostomy, or a root and Y uh, reconstruction. So birth one uh, is the uh, is where we connect the duodenum straight to the uh, to the uh, to the remnant stomach. The most common post gastrectomy syndrome associated with Bilroth-1 is, uh, is, is reflux of biliary contents into the stomach causing alkaline gastritis. But the, um, but the benefit of this procedure when it, is, when, we can, when it can be done is that it maintains gastrodenal jejunal continuity. But the, the, its uses, the uses of Bilroth-1 are limited. Uh, uh, it is not suitable for chronic duodenal or pyloric channel ulcers, uh, which are associated with uh, uh, severe fibrosis and scarring, and it's also it's useless in, uh, in more extended distal gastrectomies, where more than just the antrum is resected, where the reach is not feasible. So, uh, Billroth described the type two, which is a gastrojejunostomy, uh, and uh, uh, what the gastrojejunostomy is is uh, uh, you have a, it, it preserves the, uh, the, the jejunal continuity, but it, uh, it uh, eliminates the duodenal continuity. So you get an afferent limb uh, coming into the uh, anastomosis and the efferent limb coming out. Uh, the, the anastomosis, the, the V2 reconstruction, uh, the jejunal anastomosis can be performed in an anticholic fashion or retrocholic fashion. It can be uh, isoperistaltic, uh, 
or antiperistaltic, and there's really no functional difference between any of those. However, I can tell you based on experience that it is ideal to perform a anticholic isoperistaltic BRAS2 because if you want to convert your B2 to a ruin Y, it's much easier. It'd be kind of laying there in your face instead of digging into the mesocolon and trying to bring out the afferent limb going through mesocolon and up into the uh, onto the stomach. So an anticholic procedure, it mostly is once you um, you know dissect the adhesions of the amentum, it is right there in front of you and you can just divide it and move it down as a biliary limb. And we'll discuss that in a sec as well. So uh, following a B2 reconstruction, patients can expect to suffer somewhat from alkaline reflux and some dumping. Uh, but unlike uh, B1 reconstruction, it can also lead to some malabsorption, malabsorption specifically um, uh, fat-soluble vitamins because of the loss of duodenal continuity. And residents frequently ask me why why, why B2? Why don't you do B1 anymore? Uh, well, well as, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, the reach for B1 is always an issue, especially when you have uh, a scarring which makes the renal mobilization harder. And in this day and age, it, it, we, we we don't get any more simple ulcers. Uh, most ulcer disease we encounter is, is just bad ulcer disease where there's a lot of scarring. In addition, you want to resect as much of the stomach as possible uh, to facilitate emptying and minimize uh, gastric stasis and with more resection of the antrum and the body it's harder for the duodenum to reach up to the uh, to the remnant stomach uh, the urinary reconstruction uh, with this uh, with this reconstruction patients suffer from lesser degrees of uh, alkaline reflux than seen in either uh, uh, of, uh reconstructions uh, but uh, it does have other side effects of course it does not preserve the duodenal or, du or duodenal continuity. Uh, when you do a when you res when you do a RNY, uh, you will interrupt the migratory motor complex uh, of the small bowel, which can lead to restasis, which we will discuss la uh, later. Um, and uh, what what is the optimal length of the of the limb? I mean, you ha there's a ba there's a balance between the limit that that uh, that is too short, which increases the risk of bile reflux, and uh, too long, which predisposes also to restasis. So, you know, looking at all the reconstructions, um, they are all associated with dumping, um, uh, who, uh, being less than the others. Um, they, uh, they are B2 and Ru and Y are associated with malabsorption versus B1. Uh, and alkaline reflux does not exist with, uh, uh, or is minimal with a root and Y reconstruction. So uh, moving on to bleeding duodenal ulcers, the the primary management of a bleeding ulcer uh, is, uh, is is endoscopy. Endoscopic management of whether it's a gastric ulcer or or, or a duodenal ulcer uh, uh, is is feasible. Uh, you, you can do clipping. Uh, you can um, inject uh, with the hypertonic saline or epinephrine, or you can use cautery. Uh, but uh, uh, another uh, another inter inter intervention could be inter uh, could be uh, IR or embolization, and um, with uh, IR uh, you don't have to do a CT angiogram because uh, more than likely we know where the ulcer is. This patient has been scoped before, and you know the ulcer is either in the duodenum or in the or wherever on the stomach. So the, the radiologist uh, doesn't have to scan them. Uh, ideally, you want to have a creatinine which is less than 1.5, a normal INR, and place is great, greater than 50. Embolization um, uh, occurs with coils or gel foam, um, and, and the indications are pretty gray uh, for uh, angiographic embolization. When is the correct time? Which which is the um, which which is the patient population which ideally benefits from this? Um, we're not going to get into it. Uh, because uh, this is probably a grand rise on its own. But um, briefly, um, indications for angiographic embolization is uh, are massive GI bleed, um, or GI bleeding uh, failing to respond to endoscopic therapy. But one for sure not indication is hemodynamic instability. Um, if a patient is hemodynamically unstable, 
they belong in the OR and not in the, the um, uh, radiology suite. So the surgical management of a bleeding ulcer uh, entails uh, an incision on top of the uh, uh, anterior on the uh, on the bulb of the duodenum because the, the biggest culprit for a bleeding ulcer is uh, is a branch or or the the gastrointestinal artery and um, you have to perform a, a three point ligation uh, which means you have to place three stitches uh, on around the ulcer to try and ligate the proximal the distal and the branch to the pancreas of the gastrointestinal artery. Uh, this this um, defect is uh, closed in a Heineken Michelix uh, fashion. So you have to ensure that when you do a, an incision on the duodenum, uh, you want it on the duodenal bulb and you want to extend it proximally onto the stomach through the pylorus. Uh, if, you're, if, if by the rare chance the ulcer does not happen, uh, or it's not, it's not found in the bulb, you can always kind of elevate and look further down distally, but there's very few ulcers which exist uh, in uh, the second or third portion of the duodenum. So once you, you, you do your, uh, your ligation, you close this in a, uh, in a, in a Hanukkah Michelix fashion, and you proceed uh, uh, with doing a vagonomy at the same time as possible. Uh, and don't forget to get a specimen for H. pylori. So this is a video of uh, an ulcer uh, Dr. Buchanian did uh, just last month. You can see that uh, these can be pretty brisk ulcers. Uh, the bleed could be pretty brisk. And um, the uh, uh, once you uh, locate the, the, the bleeder, you perform the three-point fixation, uh, and then you close with a polaroplasty uh, incision. Uh, we did a vagonomy at the same time, but uh, we didn't take any pictures. Uh, so a, a, a tool um, uh, which uh, we can use as surgeons for perforated duodenal ulcers um, uh, is a polaric exclusion. The treatment of a perforated ulcer, of course, is primary closure. That's of the duodenum. Um, however, however, if the defect is large, or if it's uh, on the polaric channel, or if it's a tenuous closure, um, a, a duodenal exclusion uh, uh, might be helpful. And what that is, 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 is firing a, a non-bladed um, stapler, which is a TA stapler um, across the pylorus. Uh, you can also make an incision on the uh, uh, greater curvature of the stomach and suture the pylorus closed, but it's easier to do a, a just do a stapled uh, closure. Uh, and what this, this does, it uh, diverts the flow of gastric contents away from your repair into a gastrogenosomy you will create. Um, and with this reconstruction, you, you, get, you have the choice of placing a retrograde duodenostomy uh, tube uh, and a, uh, a jejunal feeding tube uh, for nutrition. The, be the, the, uh, the benefits of um, uh, of a duodenal exclusion is that, it, is that it protects your repair. It also allows uh, uh, for diet in case there's a leak. Uh, the patient can tolerate food. Uh, if this, if, you, if your if your ulcer is adequately drained with external drainage, um, and there is uh, and you have polaric, uh, the polaric is, is excluded, then food can tumble down your B2, uh, and you know nutrition would not be an issue on those patients. Um, again, two, two surgical legacy procedures uh, for the management of a difficult uh, duodenal stump are the, uh, the Bancroft procedure and the Nissen technique. The, um, the Bancroft procedure, uh, uh, you have to plan ahead for it, and uh, you have to make sure you maintain the blood supply to the very distal part of the stomach uh, by not dividing the gastroparoic vessels. And what uh, this does is you, you open the, the stomach and you strip the mucosa away, make sure you uh, remove all antral, uh, all, all G cells, and then the cuff is closed uh, uh, with a suture line or a staple line. So you have a pliable, uh, healthy tissue instead of the indurated uh, uh, duodenum uh, you have. Um, that, 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 that is where the ulcer is. The, the Nissen technique, uh, this picture is, uh, or schematic is pretty confusing, and I couldn't find a better picture, but it's a, perf it's a perforated posterior duodenal ulcer. Uh, 
And once the uh, once the dunectomy is, is performed, the uh, duodenum is fluffed down onto the ulcer itself and suture closed like it's kind of fish mouths on the pancreas, uh, and close. And this way, it can close the uh, GI tract. Again, both are surgical legacy uh, uh, procedures. I don't think anybody does these anymore, uh, uh, but just worth mentioning uh, just for the boards. Moving on to the role of ergonomy in the management of peptic ulcer disease, the vagus nerve plays a central role um, in the um, in the regulating gastric acid production. Uh, this description of vagal innervation has long been advocated as an uh, anti-secretory measure. At its peak application, uh, vagotomy is performed in conjunction with either a pyroplasty or an entrectomy, and was once the gold standard for the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. So uh, the primary procedure, uh, like the entrectomy, is used to treat the complication, and the vagotomy is done to minimize um, the recurrence rates. So the role of the gonomy in bleeding ulcers. Uh, although there has been a significant decrease in the number of acute bleeding ulcers over the recent years, uh, the percentage of bleeding ulcers that need operation and the percentage of patients undergoing vagotomy each year has remained relatively stable. Vagotomy combined with a drainage procedure like a pyroplasty has been associated with significantly lower post-operative mortality, mortality rates than just um, uh, over sewing alone. Vagotomy does not necessarily need to be done at the same time of the index operation. It can be performed at a later date. And in two studies comparing vagotomy and drainage versus vagotomy with resection, resection resulted in no improvement in short-term outcomes but it was, was, and was significantly uh, associated with prolonged hospital stay and decreased long-term survival for bleeding to renal ulcers. As for gastric ulcers, even though 50% of uh, ulcers are hyposecretory, vagotomy should be performed in a, in a, uh, with, with the entrectomy. There's no role for vagotomy in perforated ulcers. Uh, patients usually are septic. They're, they, you know, you want to get them in and out of the OR as fast as possible and going up and uh, digging up the hiatus and extending your incision. Uh, really, it's not indicated uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, disease condition. Uh, a role of vagotomy in gastric out of uh, gastric out obstructions for younger patients, uh, especially those who are smokers or uh, users of NSAIDs, an entrectomy and, vag and vagotomy are indicated. In older patients, like this patient of mine, uh, this I did this patient in 2017. You can see the stomachs extending down all the way to the to the to the pelvis. We were able to do this uh, do the laparoscopic gastrectomy on her. Uh, the, we, uh, we we perform entrectomies only because uh, vagotomy increases the rate of gastroparesis in chronically obstructed stomachs like these. Uh, so unless you have an active ulcer in an elderly, elderly patient, the vagotomy is not really indicated. <clears throat> what about refractory ulcers and vagotomies? So for, uh, uh, again, for, uh, for uh, to deal ulcers, uh, Entrectomy is not superior uh, in, manage in the management of, the, of this disease, and it has a higher morbidity. Uh, vagotomy and pyroplasty are uh, really uh, uh, the way to go. Uh, but uh, there, there is a spin on this. You can, uh, you, a, the Taylor procedure um, is a posterior truncal vagotomy and an anterior serosal myotomy. And the Hill-Barker procedure is a posterior truncal vagotomy with an anterior highly selective vagotomy. And both these procedures preserve pyloric function with no need for a drainage procedure. So dumping, theoretically, is a bit less. Uh, as for gastric ulcers, um, again, excision or resection is required, um, and vagotomy is, uh, is uh, always indicated. Marginal ulcers are uh, ulcers at the gastrojejunal anastomosis, most frequently after a Rue and Y gastric uh, bypass. The jejunal aspect of the anastomosis is mostly what's involved. Um, it, they predispose to a, a higher risk, much higher risk of perforation than bleeding. Uh, and uh, treatment is mostly with PPIs, uh, but uh, uh, when they are refractory, then uh, revision uh, to a smaller pouch uh, is indicated with or without a vagotomy. So moving on to uh, post gastrectomy complications. Of course, the uh, uh, the the, the uh, 
the, mo the most feared uh, complication is a leak. And uh, leaks uh, can be either, uh, when, you are, when you are suspecting a leak, you, just, you should start broad spectrum antibiotics. And leaks can be either contained or, um, or free, uh, free leaks. If a leak is contained and it's adequately drained, uh, adequately drained like in this uh, picture here, then um, uh, nothing needs to be done. If a patient stays MPO, you continue antibiotics uh, and uh, with some parenteral therapy, and this will likely heal on its own. If it's a free leak, um, then if the index operation was done laparoscopically, there's nothing wrong with going back in laparoscopically and trying to drain uh, your leak. Uh, it's a futile endeavor to try and put sutures uh, in, your, um, in, your, uh, in, in the leak, just widely drain and get out. Uh, otherwise, just, uh, you can do an open operation, put drains, and uh, again, uh, um, uh, get, get out of the, the belly. Uh, for uh, the, 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 One of the most feared complications are duodenal stump leaks. They're very hard to manage. It's essentially a, a duodenal uh, cutaneous fistula. Um, it's very hard to control the flow of bile um, to the skin, and it's a very, very morbid uh, complication. Uh, longer term uh, complications of, uh, of post gastrectomy complications include strictures, which usually uh, happen late. Patients present with nausea and vomiting and early satiety. Uh, uh, early treatment is uh, uh, dilation, or if, if it doesn't work, uh, just revision of the gastrojejunostomy. Uh, internal hernia is uh, it happens after B2 or uh, RUNY. Uh, Volvulus can happen in the susception of the jejunum. Of the jejunum into the stomach is rare, but can happen. Afferent loop obstruction is something worth talking about. Um, you, um, it's essentially a mechanical obstruction of the afferent limb, which is the limb coming from trite to anastomosis. Uh, there are many causes for it, uh, including kinking, anastomotic narrowing, vulvulus, or adhesions. Um, uh, this complication can be minimized by minimizing the length of, uh, of bowel from trite to the anastomosis. And uh, patients present with abdominal pain, bloating, vomiting, uh, both acute and uh, uh, long term. And uh, the treatment is uh, either revision of the anastomosis, uh, if there is a narrowing, or a, a simpler way is uh, just converting your B2 to a RUNY. And this happens by uh, dividing your, your afferent limb just proximal to the anastomosis and then bringing uh, your point A to point B about 60 centimeters down from the anastomosis to minimize bile reflux. Um, uh, complications related to motility after gastrectomies, uh, these can be divided into rapid transit or slow transit. Uh, the uh, rapid uh, transit uh, uh, is defined mainly by dumping, which is a phenomenon usually caused by the destruction of a, or bypass of the pyloric sphincter. It is uh, clinically uh, Clinically significant in about 20% of patients after a pyloroplasty or a, <clears throat> a distal gastrectomy. Although the precise mechanism of dumping is incompletely understood, the syndrome is frequently attributed to the rapid emptying of hyperosmolar chyme uh, into the small bowel. There are two types of dumping, uh, early and late. Um, the diagnosis is clinical, uh, but can be supported with a monitored glucose challenge, a gastric emptying study, or an upper GI. Treatment is conservative, and more than likely, this, reserves, uh, this resolves on its own. Um, uh, another uh, rapid transit uh, complication is post vagotomy syndrome, which equals essentially diarrhea. It's more, uh, it's more free, uh, it happens more frequently uh, than, uh, than gastroparesis, 30% versus 3% of gastroparesis. It has unclear pathogenesis. It's thought to be related to unconjugated bowel salts making their way uh, down the GI tract. So cholesteramine sometimes can help, but again, most of the time this is self-limited. Um, re uh, complications related to slow transit. Um, uh, there are three uh, syndromes. Uh, you have uh, uh, gastric stasis, uh, alkaline gastritis, and root stasis syndrome. Uh, gastric stasis or gastroparesis, patients present with fullness, pain, early satiety, bloating, vomiting, the workup is an upper GI and a gastric emptying study. Uh, treatment is uh, prokinetic agents, um, specifically metoprochromide and erythromycin. There's really no, no proven role for, for electric stimulation. Uh, 
uh, or gastric pacemakers uh, after vagotomy. Uh, if there's poor emptying secondary to a large pouch, then reoperative gastrectomy is uh, is indicated. Alkaline gastritis uh, happens uh, uh, when uh, the uh, when the bile um, preferentially stays uh, uh, flows and stays into the remnant stomach. Um, it's uh, diagnosed uh, uh, using endoscopy, sometimes by a biliary scan. And the treatment, again, is just like a, a Rulem syndrome, uh, so, uh, so afferent loop syndrome, where you can convert your, uh, um, your B2 to a Rulem Y, but also you can perform a procedure called the Braun procedure, where you create an enteroenterostomy between the biliary limb and the efferent limb, but again, 50 or 60 centimeters from your anastomosis, and hopefully this preferentially uh, uh, diverts the bile uh, away from the stomach. Rheostasis uh, is uh, it, it happens uh, with uh, with Ru and Y reconstruction. Uh, uh, the, far, the, uh, the findings uh, are, are similar uh, to patients who have uh, a, a gastric uh, a gastroparesis, but with one important exception is that uh, you will see a dilated, often flaccid Ru limb. Uh, medical treatment uh, again is um, is prokinetic agents. Uh, surgical intervention is um, rarely successful. Uh, it entails resection of the uh, root limb and reconstruction. But again, the likely surgical, the likely cause of this problem is uh, is interruption of the migratory mo motor complex or the, the small bowel intestinal pacemaker, um, and this will not be uh, fixed successfully in the majority of time. Um, in summary, don't forget about H. pylori, perforated ulcers. Uh, you have oversewing plus minus ex exclusion for denial ulcers. Vagonomy is not indicated for bleeding ulcers or bleeding denial ulcers, three point ligation, pyloroplasty and vagonomy, bleeding gastric ulcers, entrectomy and vagonomy, gastric auto obstructions. Younger patients, you do an entrectomy and vagonomy, older patients, just an entrectomy. And for refractory ulcers, it's essentially the same approach as bleeding ulcers. And this marks our the end of our talk. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Katie. I'm certain uh, we'll have uh, some questions and commentary. I'll start off. You know, I think that uh, uh, part of the decision making tree relates to the patient's prior history uh, uh, and risk factors as to whether or not they've been on uh, therapy for uh, peptic ulcer disease and then have, uh, uh, let's say, in the case of bleeding uh, or their, their use of uh, NSAIDs uh, and whether or not you know their prior H. pylori if they've been tested and treated for it. Can you sort of comment how those, and, and also the, the reliability of the patient uh, for, for being able to be followed and take their medications, the chronicity of their ulcer disease, and, and certainly uh, uh, whether they're at risk for uh, uh, having a gastrin producing uh, tumors. Uh, maybe you can comment on how some of those factors might impact people's decision making on their oral board exam questions. So, uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when patients uh, present with a gastric ulcer or with a peptic ulcer, uh, the first, you know, the first treatment algorithm is uh, uh, is an endoscopy with uh, PPIs, and uh, we maintain the. Uh, the, the treatment is maintained that, uh, that way for, you know, depends on if it's complicated or not complicated. Uh, we, as, as surgeons, we don't see much of this, unfortunately. It's mostly the GI docs who see this. Uh, so, they, and sometimes they hold on to these patients forever. Um, some GI docs uh, uh, would refer those patients three or four months or five months uh, uh, for surgical management. And again, when they when this happens, you have to make sure that uh, the, the, the ulcer is still there. You have to do another H. pylori test. Um, and, and patients sometimes just don't, they, they hide the complete truth. Sometimes they have, they have arthritis, they want to take their NSAIDs, they cannot get off their leave. Um, 
Uh, and so this plays a major factor um, in the treatment of those patients. Uh, smoking is a big uh, thing as well. Uh, I mean, most patients don't want to quit smoking. And uh, this would really impact your their condition and your outcome as well. Um, so I, uh, I prefer uh, not to operate on patients who have, who have uh, uh, who are smokers. I, I understand that patients cannot get off their leave uh, or their uh, NSAIDs for their arthritis, but I prefer not to operate on patients who are smokers. Um, and I tell them that. Uh, and uh, but this is an elective situation. In the in the in the emergent situation, all bets are off. You just have to take care of the, the problem. Um, and if you are there trying to do the gardening at the same time, uh, you know, in this day and age, we can send patients home uh, on uh, PPIs and get away with it. Um, and there is really no studies out there comparing uh, vagotomy to uh, to PPI therapy uh, uh, with entrectomy. Um, so, and this is actually we are accruing a patient population, which we're going to look at our numbers. Um, uh, but there's no so so if if they have if they are not reliable, uh, then you have to do a, a vagotomy regardless uh, because you can't trust them to take the PPIs and they will come back with a recurrent ulcer. Uh, so the algorithm is pretty complicated. Uh, but uh, I try to simplify it as much as possible with, with, with this talk. Question, comment? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Dr. Larson. Yes, Dr. Okay. Larson. yes, Jerry Larson here. Fareed, that was just an excellent overview with nice uh, diagrams and uh, pictures. Uh, you know, the, the volume of cases we do for uh, duodenal and gastric ulcer is way down, as you said, in nationwide and at hospitals like Norton's. But at university, when we did our study, we were still doing two or three cases a month, 35 a year, and most of them were emergency, as you as you said. And uh, you just mentioned the compliant or non-compliant patient. Uh, Jason Smith and I, when we looked at our data, if we know a patient has an emergency operation, let's say for bleeding or perforation and they're stable otherwise, if we know they're gonna be non-compliant and not take PPIs or, uh, or continue smoking and NSAID use, we sort of tilted our decision tree towards doing a vagotomy as a de definitive procedure because they probably would be non-compliant in the post-op period. So I'd like your comment on that. And then second, I would certainly agree with you when a patient has a gastric outlet obstruction and a huge stomach like you showed, we should be, we should probably not do a vagotomy, at least in the older patients, because they will have, on, that'll just exacerbate the motility problems post-op. So I just like your comment on that, and I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. So, um, you know, as I said, you know the, the non-compliant patient is very, very challenging to um, uh, to manage. Um, and if you have a perforated ulcer and the patient's unstable, uh, it's hard to uh, you know go up in the hiatus and try and right. dissect uh, the um, the vagus nerves and uh, get them out. Um, it's a much, much easier operation laparoscopically than open. Uh, but nevertheless, you know. Uh, it, 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 we have to try and uh, capture them, give, give them the system. Uh, but it is, it, and this is the reason why um, uh, we probably see a higher rate of uh, peptic ulcer disease in patients uh, uh, who uh, are underserved with, uh, um, who have uh, lesser access to uh, doctors who are uninsured, uh, who cannot pay for their uh, for their medications. Um, mm -hmm. th this is this is the weakness of our system, unfortunately, and. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what, the, what, a good, what a good answer is for that. And the gastric outlet obstruction and vagotomy? Oh, um, yeah, I, so typically uh, I see those, as, as I mentioned, I typically see them in the, in the older patients. Uh, uh, I haven't seen a gastric outlet obstruction in a younger patient. Uh, uh, just, just on Monday we did a distal gastrectomy on a refractory ulcer on um, uh, on a, on a, a 36-year-old, uh, and uh, we did a vagotomy on her, but uh, I totally agree that uh, we should not be doing. I mean, I, God knows I don't want an, another gastropathic on my on my in my office, mm -hmm. so uh, <laughs> I'd rather uh, not do vagotomy if possible. And so uh, I'll try and shy away from it whenever I can. <laughs>
Hey, Fareed, this is Bill Cheadle. Great comprehensive overview. <clears throat> many, many times I've uh, made rounds on people post-op from perfed ulcers or bleeding ulcers, and they're not on anti-H. pylori treatment in hospital. And just, I just wanted to re reiterate your first mm -hmm. point about not forgetting about H. pylori, because that is uh, commonly, unfortunately, forgotten on rounds sometimes post-operatively. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, we we frequently uh, we frequently forget about H. pylori. Um, we uh, just uh, as as surgeons, we tend to not not to think um, about it. Uh, it. It is a, a quote unquote medical condition, but this is this plugs straight into our practice, and so uh, we have to be aware. Just like we're aware of C. diff, we have to be aware of H. pylori. These are two two. Uh, two bugs which really play a major role in our surgical practice. Absolutely. All right, I want to thank uh, Dr. Katie for an excellent uh, grand round and we can begin QI conference. Well, thank you.